Well, hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talks. This is a series of how-to videos where we cover in the electrical world the practical applications of things to do with electrical construction and maintenance. And we're going to take a look at everything in these uh, series of videos from basic electrical theory to the equipment and systems uh, right on down to the codes and standards and so forth that apply to their installation, applications, maintenance, and so forth. These Tech Talk videos are brought to you by ECNM Magazine. You can find them at ecmweb.com. That's ecmweb.com. And if you go in the upper left-hand corner, you'll find a drop-down menu. The very first item in that drop-down menu is our Members Portal, where you'll find premium content. That's what you want to do. You want to go. It's free. It's easy to sign up. Go to that Members Only Portal. Sign up for the premium content and you'll be able to access tons of information, especially on the topic of uh, grounding and bonding that we're going to be talking about today. So that's ecmweb.com. Sign up for that premium content. I'm Randy Barnett, and uh, I'm a journeyman electrician, uh, certified electrical safety compliance professional, electrical inspector, and so forth anyway. And so I'll be our facilitator and host as we move through these Tech Talk videos. So, today we're going to talk about grounding and bonding, and uh, let's get started. Look at some of the different items in grounding and bonding. We're going to uh, begin uh, by talking about the National Electrical Code, I think, the NEC. I'm going to be using the 2020 version of the NEC as we go through this, of course. And we're going to get an overview. I mean, my goodness, Article 250 of the National Electrical Code is probably the biggest article in the NEC. I know in the past NFPA have said that uh, Article 250 and the whole topic of grounding and bonding is probably the most misunderstood topic in the NEC. And that's probably true. And come, some of it comes with some of the, uh, I think, some of the wording and terminology can get confusing. And why we even ground and bond and so forth. So we'll talk about that as we go through. Uh, from there, we're going to take a look at really some of the practical applications, as I said earlier, about what we do in these Tech Talk videos. Not everything about the world of grounding and bonding is covered in the National Electrical Code. For instance, if, I, if you're familiar with the NEC and I told you that you could use a rubber hose for bonding, you would say you're crazy. That's not in the NEC. You can't use a rubber hose to carry electrical current. Well, what's the correct answer? The answer is it depends. We're going to take a look at uh, some additional standards that would apply in the world of grounding and bonding that you may be working with out there and not even realize their additional requirements. So we'll get into that after we've run through the NEC then. So let's begin by taking a look at Article 250. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have your NEC uh, available and open, to certainly to use it, take notes in it, highlight it, and so forth. Uh, if you don't, uh, to just take some notes for now on a sheet of paper or whatever and go back or come back and, and watch this video later on and follow through with the prompts up on the screen as far as the types of information that are in the different parts and sections and so forth. So Article 250 is on grounding and bonding. Actually, uh, the, the, the terminology is maybe the first thing we ought to clear up. And if we take a look at Article 250, it's kind of different. You see, the whole NEC is written as a uh, prescriptive, prescriptive document. In other words, it tells us how to install our electrical equipment how. Well, I go back to 90.1. It says, you know, the purpose of the NEC is basically to make sure that, that buildings don't burn down and people don't get shocked and electrocuted. And so that's why I ground and bond. And uh, okay, but Article 250 is, and, that, and that's why I apply all my rules throughout the NEC. But uh, Article 250 is a little different in that it has Section 250.4. And 250.4 actually tells us why we ground and bond and explains some really, I think, some basic theory to us. Now remember, that's unusual because the code tells us back in Article 90 that this is not a manual for untrained persons. You're already the electrical expert when you open up the NEC, huh? Okay. So we'll see what we can understand about 250.4, and that will help us then to apply all of the following requirements, the prescriptive requirements as we call them in the rest of Article 250. Now, so what does 250.4 tell us? 250.4 tells us why we ground and bond. Okay, ground. If I take uh, if I take something like here's a little section of ground rod. If I take this ground rod and stick it into the earth, 
I've connected it to the earth. I've grounded it, huh? And if I take a piece of wire and connect to this ground rod, I've now connected that piece of wire to the earth. So I have grounded whatever that wire is connected to. I've grounded that electrical system, whatever it is. Now I can find these definitions. We can go back all of your definitions for Article 100. I mean, excuse me, for grounding and bonding are back in Article 100. So we can, and, and by all means, go back to Article 100 and highlight as you need to many definitions there for grounding and bonding. Always make sure we use the right terminology when it comes to the code. Otherwise, we're going to confuse ourselves for sure. Right? So why would we ground? Why would we take a perfectly good electrical distribution system? And I'm talking about going to the windings in the transformer, the generator, and take those windings that are producing electricity and connect a wire to those windings and take that wire and connect it to the earth. That doesn't sound too smart. In fact, I guess back, oh, I don't know, back uh, when was it over 100 years or close to 100 years ago now, uh, they had even taken the concept of grounding out of the code for a while, I understand, or something. But anyway, a long time ago. So why would we want to connect an electrical distribution system to the ground? And the reason is it tells us in 250.4 two reasons. Number one is we want to limit voltage surges. Worst case scenario I can think of is a lightning strike. If I have a big lightning strike uh, somewhere and it hits my building and wants to come into this little studio here or whatever uh, and destroy all of my electronic equipment and everything else, I don't want that to happen. What do I want that? That lightning strike wants to go into the earth. If it wants them to go into the earth, let it go there. Don't try and stop it. Give it minimum resistance or in the AC world we call it impedance, don't we? Okay? So I'm going to give that lightning strike minimum impedance into the earth then. So that's one reason that I want to have a good solid connection to the earth. Now it tells me in 250.4 there are other reasons that I can have voltage surges as well. But anyway, and uh, if you the second reason that I have to connect my distribution system or that I may connect my distribution to system to ground is if you've ever worked on an ungrounded system. If you've ever worked on an ungrounded system and tried to measure a phase voltage to piece of uh, building steel or to ground or whatever, your readings are going to go all over the place as the load on that system changes. So the second reason that we connect our distribution system windings to the ground is to stabilize the voltage during normal operation. So that's the reason that we ground then. If we understand that basic reason for grounding, those, those two basic reasons, then a lot of the rules will make sense to us. Why we want a good connection into the earth? Why are we only allowed to use certain types of equipment and devices and so forth for grounding and so on? It'll make sense to us as we go through these prescriptive methods. Now, the term bonding. Bonding means I join metal together with metal. Okay, that's the way I look at it. It doesn't, uh, uh, bonding, uh, you know, if I take, here's for instance a piece of conduit. If for some reason current flows into this piece of conduit, where does it want to go? It wants to go back to the source. I've had a ground fault down here in a piece of equipment. Current wants to get back to the source. Let it go there. Give it a good low impedance path all the way back to the source, huh? So when I join this piece of conduit to another piece of conduit, I want to get a good, uh, when I put this, make sure that I get a good tight fitting, huh? So I'm going to take my screwdriver, obviously, and tighten that down. And uh, so I want proper bonding to carry all my fault current back to the, to the source. Also, another reason that I bond is, suppose this piece of conduit is energized right now. I'm standing on the earth, this piece of conduit is connected to maybe a control panel or a uh, service panel, whatever it is over here, which is connected to the earth. And so I want to make sure if I do touch this and it's energized, I'm at the same potential. I'm standing on the earth. This is bonded, meaning that not only is all my metal joined together, but back at the source, whether it's a service or a separately derived system, and that's important in grounding and bonding that term, separately derived system. Look that up in Article 100 if you're not familiar with it. Very important rules there. But anyway, um, so if this is connected all the way back to the source, and which is in turn connected to the earth, right, through our grounding electrode system, then we're at the same potential. I'm standing on the earth. This is connected to the earth. There's no reason for current to flow through my body. Right? And hopefully however much current flows through this particular uh, conduit is going to be enough to go back to the source and open or clear the fault by opening the uh, circuit breaker or the fuse. Right. About that. And as I said, there are 10 different sections 
to grounding and bonding. If you look at 250.3, there's a nice little diagram that shows you. Let's just talk a little bit about some of these different sections. Once I understand the purpose of grounding and bonding in 250.4, then it just becomes what I call electrical common sense as to where I go to in Article 250 to find my answers. As always, anytime I'm looking up something in the NEC, the first question I ask myself is, what is the question about? What am I trying to find out about? So let's take a look at these different sections and see what kind of information they have. So part one is general information, and we just discussed a little of that. Part two is on system grounding. So if I'm going to ground an electrical system, do I ground this control system or not? Well, I don't know. Go look in part two. That's what part two tells me. It talks about what systems I must ground, what systems I'm permitted to ground, and, and some systems I don't ground at all then. Right? Uh, um, part three of Article 250 now gets into the grounding electrode system and the grounding electrode conductor. So the grounding electrode system, what am I going to put underneath the earth in order to ground my distribution system? That's my grounding electrode system. So if I have a question of what type of grounding electrodes can I use? How do I install these grounding electrodes and so forth? How do I size these grounding electrode conductors that connect from my distribution system down to my grounding electrode system? That's all found in part three then. Right? Part four is a, a fairly short section, part four of Article 250, enclosure, raceways, and service cable conductors, or connections, I'm sorry, service cable connections. Part five is a big section, very important, bonding. We just talked about why we bond. Let's see. Bonding will, if I don't clear the ground fault, the building can burn down or somebody could get electrocuted. Hmm. I think part five is going to be pretty important to me. Okay. So part five is on bonding. Part six is equipment grounding and equipment grounding conductors. Our bare copper wires, our, our wire with the green insulation, our green or one or more yellow stripes on it and so forth. Our equipment grounding conductors. Okay. This is also an equipment grounding conductor, isn't it? Okay. Part seven, methods of equipment grounding conductor connections. Okay. Part seven. Part eight, direct current systems, DC systems. We have a lot of DC systems out there, depending on the industry you work in. Uh, so if you work with DC systems, part eight. Okay. And you know some of the unusual things that can happen in a DC system when you get ground faults. So, and then part nine is a fairly short section then, uh, instrument meters and relays. And, but if you work within those areas, then part nine would apply to you if you're looking for information on that. And then I know a lot of you get involved in systems over 1,000 volts, a lot of medium voltage systems, high voltage systems out there. And how do I ground those? It's a little bit different. Uh, I can have a multi-grounded neutral system where I don't ground my neutral just at one point. I may ground it at different points along the neutral. So that's covered in part 10. Uh, if you're familiar with, we have solidly grounded neutral systems and, and we may have reactance grounds and things like that, impedance grounds. So all covered in part 10 then uh, of the NEC. So that is how the NEC is divided up then, 10 different parts. So first of all, ask your, yourself your questions about what am I trying to do here? Am I trying to ground or bond? And uh, what, what, what am I asking myself? Do I need to know um, what system I have to ground? Do I have to ground this, this uh, 24 volt control circuit or not, or 120 volt control circuit or something? Um, do I need to, how do I, what about this communication system and so on? So look in the appropriate part. If I need to know, how do I terminate? How do I ground? How do I install this grounding electrode? has to be in contact with the earth for so many feet. That's not nearly long enough, is it? It's not near eight feet. But anyway, uh, what if I can't get it in? What if I hit a rock? Can I put it in an angle or do I have to bury it horizontally and so forth? See what the code says, right? All found in the appropriate part. So familiarize, familiarize yourself with those different parts in the NEC and uh, go to them as you need to to look up information. Hey, I thought we'd do, uh, I said we'd do a practical application, so we will. Let's take a look at, um, Something that's kind of fun here. This is not in the NEC. I told you that I may be able to use this rubber hose for bonding. And the answer is sometimes. If you recognize this at all, this is a, a, a rubber pressure hose. It's used on things like vacuum trucks. Okay? So if you think about it, if I'm going to hook this rubber hose up to a vacuum truck, 
So I've got maybe one end of it hooked up to my vacuum truck. And of course, it's a big long hose. And I'm gonna have the other end over here, uh, uh, maybe a nozzle on it or, or something that I'm gonna put this into a tank and have a special fitting on it, put it into a tank and pump some liquid out of a tank. And that liquid happens to be, maybe it's flammable. Or I could get some flammable vapors off that liquid. You know, once I've opened it up and I start pumping, I could get some vapors out of it. That's an EPA consideration as well, but that's, that's separate. So uh, I better make sure that I don't get any sparks. And sure enough, I can off of something like this because I'm going to create some static electricity, right? As electrical current flows through this rubber hose, I'm probably going to strip some electrons out of that tank and they're going to accumulate in my truck over here. So that's going to leave a positive charge on my tank and a, uh, the excess electrons will be a negative charge over here in my truck. So there's a potential difference. When I go to pull this hose out of the tank, then electrons could try and flow through the air and jump back to the tank where they came from. I could get a spark and if there's enough energy in that spark, it's going to ignite those surrounding vapors. And when that happens, it's usually catastrophic and fatalities are often involved. You can easily find many examples by just searching the internet. So this particular hose, yes, it's different. It actually has a piece of wire that runs through the hose and connects at each end. So it's actually not the rubber that I'm using for the bonding. I set you up for that one. There is a, a small piece of wire that runs on the inside of the hose, connects at each end of it, and that is uh, how I'm able to accomplish bonding so that I keep that difference in potential the same between that tank and that truck as I'm filling up the truck or whatever it is I'm doing, or emptying the truck. Make sure our meter works on resistance. And of course, if I try and read across the rubber hose, I get infinity, OL on my meter then, right? Wherever I try and read across the rubber hose. Now, if I try and read from the metal on one end to the metal on the other end, I do get some resistance. I get continuity. It's not a very low resistance in this particular case, but it's okay. It meets the requirements of the American Petroleum Institute standard, the API standard, that governs vacuum truck operations in. Very extensive information on that, in that standard on uh, vacuum trucks okay? and grounding and bonding of vacuum trucks. So grounding and bonding, big issues you can imagine on vacuum trucks. So I need to choose and make sure that if my company is involved in vacuum truck operations, when that company comes out, or if you own the vacuum truck, that the proper hoses are being used. They are conductive. From looking at the hose, there's no marking required to be on the hose to tell me it's conductive. There's a blue stripe here. That's for pressure ratings on the hose, but nothing required to tell me whether or not it is conductive. The only way you're going to know that is to put a meter on it and test it. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. Now some other things. Uh, we're familiar with our ground rods. Okay. Here's a section of a ground rod pointed on one end and so forth. And there's copper and then it is steel in the middle, isn't it? Manufacturers tell us that actually the steel is the better conductor than the copper. It's copper clad steel. And the reason that the copper is on the outside, they tell us, is for corrosion protection. Well, anyway, kind of interesting on our copper ground rods and our copper clad. Now, we use a lot of rebar, don't we? Rebar, that uh, we can use certain rebar according to the National Electrical Code for grounding and bonding. So this must be very conductive then. So I've got an old piece of rebar here. And it's been outside, it's pretty rusty and so forth. So if I take this rebar and um, read the resistance across that rebar, I get OL on my meter, open circuit, huh? I'm getting infinity. Holy, man, that's not good, holy buckets, man. This is rust, good. that iron rust on there is um, a good insulator. It's not conductive. So rust is not conductive. But wait, then you're gonna, you can't use that for, no. Uh-uh, okay, because what happens when I put it in concrete? What's, ha what's in that concrete? That lye, lime in the concrete, that lye is gonna eat away that rust and pretty soon that rebar is going to be very conductive. In fact, I've got a couple of spots on here, if I can find them, yeah, there we go, where I've uh, scraped away some of the uh, rust and let's see what we read on the actual steel here. And yeah, we do get continuity then, okay? So pretty interesting. Another item is that 
we have minimum requirement, or excuse me, maximum requirements, I guess we should say, in the NEC for resistance into the earth. And um, this particular meter reads that resistance into the earth. Okay? And so it, if you could uh, open it up and look on the inside, it's pretty hard to see, but there are two separate coils in there. Uh, one coil produces a voltage, which induces current into my grounding electrode, conductor, whatever it is that I'm measuring. And then the other conductor reads the amount of current that flows. And of course, through the electronics, it then reads out in ohms of resistance. And uh, so it's a pretty, pretty handy meter. When I first turn it on, it will calibrate itself. And then after it calibrates itself, I'm ready to take a reading. Follow your manufacturer's instructions, okay? You think about it. You know when you read resistance, you're reading, you know, uh, am I reading a series resistance? Or what if I'm reading parallel paths and all of that? So keep that in mind. Follow your manufacturer's instructions in, depending on the type of uh, earth resistance meter that you have. Okay? So an earth ground clamp can be a handy piece of equipment. In fact, with this one, you can calibrate it. Comes, uh, you can stick this in here and turn it on and actually calibrate it. So that's pretty handy as well. So grounding and bonding, one of the most misunderstood topics in the National Electrical Code, the NFPA has told us, but not true. If you understand the difference between grounding and bonding, take a look at 250.4, review those sections in the code. Now, always ask yourself first, what is the question? What is the question? What am I trying to find out here? Then go to the appropriate section in the NEC. Don't forget to use the index in the back, lots of information back there. And remember, you may be working outside of the NEC. And so take a look at other codes and standards that may apply to you. So, ECNM Tech Talks is brought to you by ECNM Magazine, which is in the portfolio of Endeavor Business Publications. I want to thank you again for attending. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about electrical safety. We're going to remove all of that confusion, I hope, all of those rules about NFPA 70E and Arc Flash. Put it all into perspective and see the rules that we can follow to be safe out in the field. And so, that'll be our next Tech Talk. Until then, Work safe out there, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.